We're going to move to our final speaker and then we're going to open the floor for questions. So please start thinking about what questions you'd like to ask these uh, world experts in motor neuron disease because uh, we're going to get cracking with uh, question time straight after Professor Leonard Vanderberg. But please allow me to introduce Professor Leonard Vanderberg. He's the Professor of Neurology and the Director at the Netherlands ALS Centre University Medical Centre in Utrecht. He's the Chairman of the Neuromuscular Centre in the Netherlands and the Chairman of the European Network to Cure ALS, NCALS, which hopefully will partner with our Pan-Australian one to really get a global effort towards eliminating ALS. Leonard will discuss clinical trials, accelerating ALS or MND therapy and development through new innovative clinical trial design. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Speak here. I thought I'll, after a 24-hour flight, I come over one day to one day early to see Perth. But then Carol asked me to speak here, and uh, saying no to Carol is suicide. So uh, <laughs> I am um, happy to be here, and it's good reason to come back to Perth uh, another time. Um, Treatment. Uh, why does it take so long to find a treatment? And I, I understand that you're all very impatient and you're short of time. And we are also, as researchers and clinicians, impatient because we see lots of patients and we do want to find a treatment for, for our patients. Why does it take so long? It's because the process is quite long. The first part, you may have seen this before, is the preclinical pre part. Uh, where all the research is done in animal, uh, animal models or cellular models. And then if there's a, an interesting candidate treatment, it needs to be tested in healthy individuals, whether it's safe. Uh, and that's called the phase one, a phase one study. It also may involve some patients to get some feeling uh, about safety most, mostly, but also about dosing of the, of, the, of the treatment. The next phase is phase two. Um, that's a larger study. It involves uh, ALS patients. And, and it, uh, it's designed to, to investigate whether the drug is, is safe and maybe some clue whether there's some effect. If that is true, then the um, next phase will start, a phase three study, and that's a, a larger study, and that's all aimed to, to, to investigate the effect, efficacy of, of the drug. So that whole process may, may take years, up to, up to 10 years. So what, what our goal is and what we should do is, is try to accelerate that, that, that process. And I, I'm, I'm happy to say that it's actually time for some optimism. Um, uh, many discoveries in the preclinical phase have been made and there's now also well, a, a success in, in, in gene therapy showing that, that ALS is a treatable disease. So that's very important. It's a first step, but hopefully many steps will follow. So we have to concentrate on the phase two and the phase three studies to accelerate those, um, to accelerate um, the uh, discovery of a, of a treatment. This may be a little bit busy slide. It's just an overview of the phase uh, two and three studies that have been done over the last uh, decades. And it shows that, that, that if you, the, so the, old, the one on the left is, is, the, uh, um, is the time of the, of the trial, so the duration of the trial. And as you can see, there's quite some variation. I think that's the message of this whole slide, that between all these trials, there's just lots of variation. So one trial lasts only several months, while so, well, another trial lasts uh, 18 months. And that's also true for the primary outcome. Now, primary outcome means the, uh, the primary um, uh, uh, fu uh, function or, or, or the, the primary measurement uh, that will determine whether a, a study is positive or, or ne negative. So that can be a functional score uh, or, or survival, but also muscle strength, strength measurements. So there's quite some variation also in the, in the primary outcome measures and also in the sample size. So as you can see, the phase two studies are smaller and the phase three studies are larger. But even between the phase three studies, there's, there's lots of variation. So if we could find what we call a master protocol, one protocol that fits all drugs, that will help enormously in accelerating the process. So we have to work on that and to find consensus among researchers, but also companies, to have a more uh, harmonized uh, drug uh, discovery design. 
So what is the aim of a clinical, clinical uh, trial? Um, well, one aim, of course, is very important. It needs to be a safe uh, drug. So that's the goal, of the aim of, of all phases uh, in, the, in the process. But what the, the second aim, and that's even more important, is that it should slow down the disease. And how, how do we measure that? That's, that's very important. So how do we determine whether a therapy is, is effective? So if there's a large effect, so this is an example of antibiotics, uh, that's, you don't need a, lot, a very long trial to investigate the effect of antibiotics. There's a good biomarker, as you can see here, you measure the, the growth rate of the bacteria in, 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 in a dish or in, or in a patient, and the effect that you see is also, is, uh, is there after seven minutes, and, and the patient um, um, get, becomes healthy uh, very in a few, few days. So if, if the effect is very large, you don't need to do a large trial. And that may be very far away for, for ALS, but um, as, you, as I said, there's now one, one good result in a trial, a good first result in a trial in patients that have the SOD1 mutation, as you just heard from, from Amar, that's one mutation in, in patients with ALS. And this is, um, as you may remember this slide, um, part of it from high school, or, or I don't know, it's a DNA um, makes proteins, and DNA has genes, about 30,000, that's true, Amar, is it? Yeah, 30,000. And each gene makes, makes a protein, and your whole body consists of, of proteins. So DNA makes RNA, makes proteins. And if there's a mutation in a gene, you also, that leads to a mutated protein. And if, if that protein plays a, plays a large role in, in motor neurons, um, then motor neuron disease uh, develops. So SOD1 is one of those genes, and there's now a, a therapy called antisense oligonucleotide therapy um, that actually is able uh, to block, uh, the, to, to treat the, the mutated uh, gene. Actually, it's treating the mutated RNA, so that leads to a protein that doesn't have the mutation. Other kinds of gene therapies are being developed that are targeted directly to the, to the DNA. This is one, one example of, of a relatively short uh, trial, a phase two trial in SOD1 ALS, uh, phase three is, is, uh, is ongoing. And as you can see, the uh, dotted line, uh, look at the dotted line there. I don't know if there's a pointer. Yeah. Here, yeah, it works. Um, is here, that's the normal disease progression. So it's quite a, uh, a, a progressive uh, disease. And uh, in the treated group, the, uh, the disease is almost stable. So that's a very exciting new result, and hopefully the result um, is also, will also be found in the phase uh, three study. So that's the first type of ALS that's going to be uh, uh, treated. And I think that's also what will happen in ALS. There's not gonna be one treatment for all patients. It's most likely that, the, that ALS motor neuron disease will be treated in steps, in subgroups. Subgroups of patients are going to be treated. ALS may not be uh, one disease, but may be several phenotypes um, with different causes uh, of the disease, and also those different subgroups may have to be treated with different kind of drugs or therapies. So that, now I gave you, I gave you an example uh, for familiar ALS, for genetic ALS, but 90% of the patients do not have familiar ALS. Um, so how do we measure uh, the, the effect of therapy in sporadic uh, MND, sporadic motor neuron disease? So in those, uh, for, for, for those therapies, for therapies for, for that kind of, of motor neuron disease, large effects are unlikely. Uh, there may be a slow effect, it may take some time to see the effect of the drug, and um, to, to measure the effect of the drug, we need better, uh, good out outcome measures or biomarkers. So what is a biomarker? Uh, I think um, uh, Omar or Matthew already talked about uh, multiple sclerosis. That's an inflammatory disease of the brain. Um, that's a good example of a completely untreatable disease in the 80s, 
Then the MRI scan was developed and became available. Um, on the MRI scan, you can measure the number of inflammatory lesions in, in the brain, and so it's a very good biomarker uh, to uh, measure whether a drug has an effect. And 10 years later, uh, the first drugs were developed, and now it's, it's uh, every year there's a new drug for multiple sclerosis. So biomarkers are, are very important. There's now one coming, neurofilament, for, for ALS, but we need better biomarkers. Are small effects important? Is it important to discover drugs that have a relatively small effect? Um, the answer is yes. So one example it's H is HIV uh, treatment. And um, um, well, this is the whole process of the HIV entering the cell, incorporating in the DNA, and then after a while it goes out and, and AIDS is started. It's a very short summary of, of the disease. And as you can see, uh, there are many steps in the whole process where drugs are being developed and they all have a small effect, but altogether they have a large effect. And now AIDS is, is a treatable uh, disease. So uh, if you measure, if you go for the small effects and then add them all up, you have a large effect. The same is true for cancer. A cocktail of treatment has a much better effect, and it is important to discover the relatively small effects to finally reach the large effect. This is a multiple myeloma cell. These are all the, all the arrows um, uh, are processes in, in that cell where a drug is being developed. So how do we measure small effects in ALS? This is just an example of, a functional rating, of the functional rating scale that we use in trials to measure the effect of, of drugs. And this, each line is one patient. So there's a, lots of variation between the progression of the disease between uh, uh, patients. Uh, so if, if you want to measure a small effect, it's quite, quite difficult. You need a large number of, of patients. And it's also true that you don't want to have in your trials, it's, it sounds, may, may not sound very nice for, for patients to hear, but you don't want to have patients in that do not progress because you can't measure an effect in patients that do not have a progressive disease or do not progress rapidly enough. So you want to exclude those patients and you also want to exclude uh, those patients that have a disease that's too rapid to measure an effect. So what is the best uh, trial? Uh, to, to actually have the best trial, it would be nice to have the machine that developed in the, in, the, in the movie Back to the Future. Some people may be too young for that movie, um, <laughs> if I look at the audience. Actually, they developed uh, a machine that they could, could actually Michael J. Fox, I don't know if people know, yeah, we still know him. Eh? Um, he developed a machine uh, where he could go to the future and see how it is in the future and then come back to the present and change the future by changing something in the present. And uh, so that would be the best trial design. If you would have, a, uh, like say, let's say 300 patients, you would, you would go in the machine and look at them how they are after about a year. Then you go back uh, to the present and give them a drug and then see how they are uh, after one year and then compare whether the drug is effective. Yeah, that would be the ideal trial. Don't you agree, Mathieu, Omar? Yeah, 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 oh, very good. At least there's some agreement eh, today. Yeah. It's good to agree before we take over <laughs> Australia. Eh? I'll come back to that, don't, don't worry. Um, so we need, we need placebo-controlled uh, trials, and that means that you have to have two groups one a treatment group and a control group, and they have to be similar, otherwise uh, you can't f uh, find an effect. So you have a treatment group, a control group, you do follow up and you compare them at the end. But at the beginning of the trial, you have to uh, randomize, we call that randomize the patient uh, to each group, that you end up with similar groups in the placebo group and the treatment group. Why is that important? I give you an example which is a little bit negative. It's not meant that way, but it just, I think, is important to show that it's important to, to do placebo-controlled trials. And one example is the diaphragmatic uh, pacing. Uh, that's, uh, that was a device. It's a pacemaker for respiratory function. So it was, it was put in the, in the diaphragm, diaphragm and, um, and it's actually 
uh, you had to do a surgery to implant it, and then it would stimulate the, um, the lung muscles. Does that, does that explain? Yeah. And um, so it's very logical. It sounds very a uh, good thing to have. And um, the first study was an open study in 38 patients. And uh, patients were measured, were followed up. That was the progression of the disease. And then at, sorry, this is Dutch. Uh, and then at 50% lung function, they would have the device. And as you can see in this open study, the disease course looked a lot better after the device. So the, the, uh, that, that was very promising. And uh, so the, 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 the machine or the device was approved by the FDA because there was lots of pressure on the FDA to approve it uh, because yeah, it looked very beneficial for, for patients. And the company that, that actually was selling it, it was had a very aggressive sales style. I looked that up on Google Translate. Is that, that's when you, people that call at night and want to sell you something and they don't stop talking before you buy it. And actually, that happened with that company. They would call again and again, and they, want, 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 they wanted us to do surgery on our patients for this uh, diaphragmatic uh, pacing device. And so many patients were, were treated uh, worldwide. But there were two um, uh, placebo-controlled studies done, one in Paris and one in, uh, in Sheffield. The uh, first one in, in um, Paris, um, uh, the, the red line is, the, is, the, is non-invasive ventilation. Um, and alone, and the blue line are the patients uh, that ha have non-invasive ventilation as well as the uh, diaphragmatic pacing device. As you can see here, the disease course is a lot worse in the patients that have the, the, the um, diaphragmatic pacing uh, device. And the same results were found in the study in uh, Paris. Um, they did a, uh, did a slightly different design. They did a, sh a sham um, uh, stimulation. So they implanted the device, but they didn't turn it on. So, uh, so it's just to make the groups equally. The both groups had the surgery, but one device was working, and in the other group it wasn't. And as you can see, the the group where uh, the, the, the with the active simulation, the disease course was a lot worse. So instead of 20 months be uh, better survival, it was actually a reduction of survival of 20 months. So it's very important to measure the effect of new drugs, new therapy in a placebo-controlled uh, trial. So and that, that we have to uh, improve, uh, especially the, um, from the uh, step from the phase two to the phase uh, three uh, studies, because the three, phase three studies are, are very, very expensive. Um, and as you can see here, this, this is the percentage. It's not for ALS. It's actually not as good for ALS. Um, uh, the whole process here from each process, only half goes to phase two, only a quarter goes to phase three and a half goes uh, uh, to the treatment phase. And if you add that all up, uh, all up only 6% of the, of, the, of the drugs make it uh, to, the, um, to the market. For ALS, that's 1.5%. 2 or 3%, depending if you count Adivron. Is anyone from Mitsubishi here? They come from here, no? So then it's 3, and otherwise it's uh, 1.5. In Australia and in Europe, it's 1.5. So we have to do more, and we have to do better trials. One to two successes out of 65 studies is, is not enough. So we have to do better, we have to change. Uh, only 3% of the patients are involved in trials. That should be much, much more. How many of you have been involved in trials? Yeah, th that's not enough. So we have to increase that. And, um, and it remains a challenge how to measure the effect in a therapy. So we have to improve that uh, too. We have to be careful for experimental therapy. I have to say this. Hope is not, a false hope is not hope. I, in my opinion, uh, we have to inform patients uh, better. Uh, what's on the internet is not always true. Some people think because it's coming out of a computer, it's better than what the doctor says, but I always say the better the website looks, the more careful you have to be. <laughs> the other problem is that companies make unjustified claims on, on therapy, and we have to correct that as, as doctors, um, and uh, I think that, that is, well, that I think it is um, really, um, well, uh, a crime, I would say, 
uh, how people uh, take advantage of people with an in untreatable uh, disease. Uh, for lots of money, you can get all kinds of weird uh, treatments that do not have an effect. But there is an effect claimed. So I think that's, that's an issue that we as researchers, as clinicians, uh, deal with every day and, um, and, and we have to inform we have to give our patients the correct information, although it not, may not be the information that patients want to hear. Very good site is ALS Untangled. I don't know if you heard about it. It's, it's actually an organization, many of us are involved, that reviews alternative and off-label treatments in, in an objective uh, way. There's a website, you should look at it. So what we want to achieve is uh, more patients in clinical trials, uh, we have to improve inclusion criteria, we have to use dig digital technology that's coming, uh, innovative trial design, and uh, less patients on placebo. So one, what we already achieved that most trials now have a two to, two to one um, uh, randomization, that means only one third of the patients is on placebo and not half of the, the patients. We have to also have to accelerate the drug development uh, process, and for that we need to develop a highway towards a cure. Uh, this is where we are uh, now. We are every trial and any new drug, uh, we, are, we are trying to invent the wheel again. Uh, we, are, we, we make the same mistakes again. That's also because the FDA and the EMA are very, quite conservative. I think um, better uh, uh, innovative design uh, should be implemented uh, sooner, and we want to be ready for, e for all trials, um, and for that we need to do, have consortia. So we want to join, we want to join Australia. We don't want to take over Australia. <laughs> Amar, do you think so? <laughs> we want to be part of PEC PECTELS. Yeah, yeah, so Europe joins PECTELS, okay? That can be <laughs> in the news. We do everything to find a cure for our patients. That's the, the, the message. Uh, the, in Europe, um, just to help the Australians, we, we, we try to develop a roadmap, um, which you, of course you already have, I'm sure. Um, and that's, uh, I think, the, the, the working groups that we want to establish. We want to see whether ALS is one disease. We have lots of data on environmental lifestyle risk, risk factors and on genetics. We have to dev develop better biomarkers, better trial design, platforms, trial consortia that, can, that should be very large. We can't develop a new treatment in just in one country, you need many countries that join forces uh, to have good uh, trials, and we have to develop better uh, outcome uh, measures. I'll give just three examples on how we try to improve uh, trial design and accelerate the process. One is that we developed a personalized prediction model of survival, so for each patient you can enter um, uh, eight clinical variables that are all available at, at diagnosis and put them in an algorithm and you can predict uh, survival much better, the disease course much better than just the average. We, we developed that on, uh, on uh, databases from 14 sites in nine countries in over 11,000 uh, patients. So that's a very good tool to use in uh, trials and to um, um, uh, stratify better and randomize spaces be uh, better and to have better uh, trial design. It's available online through your caregiver. So it actually helps to take to uh, predict the patients that have a very slow disease course or have a very fast disease course and to enter all the patients in, in, in trials that have the disease course that are uh, best to find a new treatment. The other way, um, method we developed um, um, to accelerate the, the, the drug discovery process is to incorporate uh, genetic data in trials. Uh, we um, re-evaluated all the lithium trials that were done uh, years ago in, in the UK, uh, Netherlands and Italy, and we found that one genetic variation, UNC13A, uh, if you had that variation, those patients did respond uh, to, to lithium in a post hoc analysis, so that needs to be uh, confirmed. And that's shown here. These are the patients that did not receive lithium. They had a faster disease course than the patients that were on lithium. And that we want to um, now confirm in a trial in Australia together with Europe. Is that good? Yeah, it's a good order, is it? Um, very important. I will stop doing it. Okay. We love you. Uh, we want to have lunch with Pectels and Ancals tomorrow in one big lunch together. Yeah? Great, good. We pay for it, okay? <laughs> uh, 
You can pay for it if you want. Um, <laughs> The other last uh, slides are the platform design uh, uh, trials you have heard about. What it means is now, what we're doing now, we, are, we start a new trial. We uh, need to be a treatment group and a placebo group. We start uh, uh, th four trials, as you can see here. It takes a lot of years to do all, all, four, all four trials. And if you have four trials, you have four placebo groups and four treatment groups. If you would now all the, do them in parallel in a platform trial, you can take advantage of, of, the, of the placebo group. You only need one placebo group for the th four different uh, drugs. So that would be a lot faster, less patients on placebo. And what's the advantage? You can add on new uh, drugs uh, during the trial and, and all those uh, new, new uh, trials, new uh, trials on new drugs can also take advantage of the placebo group. Okay, last message. Uh, is that we all should do this uh, together. Patients, uh, researchers, clinicians, also the ALS foundations and the pharma, we can do it our own, we need each other. And um, well, all the work that we do is to find an effective treatment for all patients with ALS. We are gonna reach that goal. We work very hard, we collaborate very well, we trust each other and uh, hopefully uh, treatment will come very, very soon. Thank you.